Today on Ask This Old House. I'm headed to Johnson Space Center to see how NASA's work on the International Space Station may change the way you live in your future house. So water is one of the essential uh, elements for humans to live. On the International Space Station, about 90% of that water is recycled. The heart of it is called vapor compression distillation system. This basement window has seen better days, but the fix isn't as complicated as you may think. I'll show you what to do. And now I'm gonna score it. I wanna push down firmly and make one cut and one cut only. And I'll give you the recipe to make your own concrete. For projects around the house, HomeAdvisor helps find local pros to do the work. You can check ratings, read customer reviews, and book appointments with pros online at HomeAdvisor.com. HomeAdvisor is proud to support Ask This Old House. Hey, good morning, Mark. Hey, Kevin. So we're talking concrete, um, which makes sense. We get a lot of questions from our homeowners about it, and it's a, it's a pretty easy material to work with, and there are a ton of projects around the house where we use it. Exactly. Uh, patchwork, um, walkways, garage floor, basement floor, driveway. Footings. Support footings a lot of is, footings for yeah, decks. That's a good one. All right, but today you've decided to show us how to make it ourselves, which kind of surprises me because, for me, I've always used it out of a bag, small projects, obviously, right. but this works pretty well. Why would I not want to use it out of a bag? Well, you probably would. Again, if you're doing something small, say that patch, go down to your hardware store, grab a bag, mix it up, throw it in. Great. If you're going to do a walkway, you're probably going to want to buy your materials in bulk. Number one, and most important, is you're going to save a lot of money that way. Really? So, yeah. So, so instead of buying 20, 30, maybe 60 bags of that, buy it in bulk. Right. All right, but then if I buy it in bulk, I need to know how to mix it because that's already mixed for me. Now I need to know the proportions. So we have three buckets of sand, two buckets of aggregate, and one bucket of Portland cement. Sand, aggregate, Portland cement is this basic ingredient for all concrete. Right. And then are these the proportions, this 3, 2, 1 that we're working with? These proportions will probably give you a strength of 3,000 PSI, which is pounds per square inch. And so if I wanted to go to a higher PSI? We're just going to add more stone, more Portland, and again, that will jump up the aggregate, but more materials is going to give you more strength. All right, so let's start mixing. All right, so I'm going to start with the sand. Yep. I'll go two buckets. Kevin, if you want to get that bucket of Portland for me. So you do sand and Portland first before That's right. the aggregate? That's right. I want to make sure that I have the Portland and the sand blended together. I'm going for a certain color. You're looking for a color, huh? Yeah, I want this all to be consistent. You can see it's starting to blend together right now. I'll take more. Yeah, give me that whole thing. Great. Dump that sand in. Just like that. I want to make sure that I have the uh, Portland and the sand blended together and then just take that other bucket of stone and lose it right in there. So you can see that it just binds up right. a lot better when you mix the sand and Portland together. Right. So this is actually looking pretty much the way I want it. But you'll see me dig out a little hole here, Kevin. Okay. And that's where I'm going to want my water, right there. And you're going to want to pour it slowly and not a lot at a time. Very good. And that'll be great to start with. One of the, one of the first things I learned in this trade, Kevin, was if you put too much water in, you can't take it out. So can't take it out, right? That's why we go slow, mix. You see me cleaning off the edges. All right, Kevin, give me another splash, please. Great. And how do you know when you're done? What consistency are you looking for? Actually, this is the consistency I'm looking for. This is great. You can tell that all the materials are mixed together very well. Mm -hmm. It's not too wet. It's damp. It's just the way we want it. And one of the other ways I can tell is, see that finish? Yep. So I know I'm going to get where I want to go. Perfect. Well, this is perfect. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. All right, Kevin. It. You got it. Hey, Tommy. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. How long have you guys been in this house? My fiance and I have been here for about a year. About a year. So this is a new house for you guys. Yeah, it's new. That's nice. This is the uh, window we wrote you about. Okay. 
So what do you got going on here? We think the previous owners vented the dryer out through there. Well, that's pretty common. Yeah. Now I look at it and the jam itself looks pretty good from in here. I don't see any rot and the sash looks pretty good also. So what we can do is we can take this sash right out and just replace the Senna painted glass. You up for that? Sounds good. To get started, we need to remove the screws from the hinges that go into the jam. And then take out these screws that someone put in through the sash, probably to make it more weather tight. All right, well, it doesn't look like this center pane of glass had a dry vent in it. I think it was just a broken pane of glass and they taped it up. Yep. All right, the first thing is let me give you a little bit of window anatomy because it's good to know what the pieces are in case you ever have to fix them. What's in the opening up there is your jam. At the bottom is the sill, and at the two sides in the header are just the jam. All right, so now we have the whole piece is a sash. Individual panes of glass, also known as lights of glass. And these wooden strips right here that divide the glass and hold it into place are actually called muttons. And the glass is held into the muttons with glazing compound or putty. What we need to do is scrape out that old putty and remove the glass. We're going to keep a vacuum going to suck up any of the dust. We want to make sure we use a HEPA vac. All right, we've got all the old glazing compound out of the opening where the middle glass was. Now we're going to take a measurement for that glass. So the height is 12 and an eighth. All right, so what I did is I bought a pane of glass that's 12 inches off the shelf and it fits in the opening very nice. So that eighth of an inch difference is perfect to allow for the expansion and contraction of the wood in the summertime when the wood expands from humidity. We couldn't get a piece the width that we wanted, so I got a piece that's 16 inches. So now I'm going to measure the width, and that is 10 and a 16th. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure 9 and 15 sixteenths of an inch and cut our glass. That way it'll fit right into the open and allow for the expansion and contraction of the muttons. This is the tool that we're going to use to cut the glass. This is a glass cutter. It has a little carbide wheel on it right there. That little wheel's gonna cut through the glass? Well, it's not gonna cut through the glass. It's only gonna score it. Once we score it, we snap it off. All right, so I'm gonna use my straight edge. Now what we have to do is allow for the offset of the wheel to the edge of the glass cutter. Just like that. Making sure the square is tight to the edge of the glass and I wanna hold it firmly. Before I cut it, I need to lubricate the wheel with some cutting oil. So I dip it and now I'm going to score it. I want to push down firmly and make one cut and one cut only. So now I'm just going to take it, pick up the glass, bring it over to the edge, and I want to line up my line about with the edge of the table. I want to make sure I'm over the edge. I'm going to pick up and drop it, pushing down with both hands at the same time. Pick it up, push it down. Nice. And there's your pane of glass. So we're going to use a latex glazing compound right out of the gun. That way we won't have to prime or seal the wood. Now we're ready to set the glass. Hold it in and then drop it down gently. Work it back and forth. You can see the glazing compound oozing out. Now I just work it back and forth, working that glazing compound down and around. Now to hold the glass into position, we're going to use these glazing points right here. And all they are, you can see there's a little leg on them, and I can use that to push it into position. So I take it, lay it on the glass, and I take my putty knife, I put right on that shelf like that, push it in, and I want to do about a third of the way up. Push one in there. I don't want to push down too hard because I don't want to crack the glass. Bring it over about a third of the way down and push it in, work it back and forth gently. Okay, so I have two on that side. I'm going to put two on this side. Back and forth, working it in. Now it's seated. Okay, so now I want to put one in the middle on the bottom. 
take it again back and forth gently pushing it in and one on the top all right so now that glass can't push out while we're working on it until the glazy dries all right now i'm ready to put another bead on top but i want to angle it so it comes up to the top of the mutton down to the glass now across the bottom All right, so now we're gonna clean that up with a putty knife. All right, so I'm temporarily screwing this sash back into the old opening and I'm gonna lock it because I didn't wanna leave this open for three or four days. It's gonna take three or four days for that new glazing compound to dry. After you take it out of the opening, get a razor blade and clean up all those rough edges, prime it and paint it. And I think you're going to notice a big difference because we have replaced the glass and with the new putty around the opening, you're going to feel less drafts. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Glad I could help. Nice fix, Tommy. Thanks. It is a pleasure watching you do even the <laughs> simplest of tasks and, and not an expensive fix either. No, and it's actually a pretty easy fix. I mean, with the glazing compound, the glass, and the tips to hold the glass in place, you're probably looking at less than $30. Right. And I think the most intimidating thing is whether or not you feel comfortable cutting the glass, which is actually pretty easy to do too. Right. But if you're not comfortable cutting the glass, you can go to a hardware store with the right dimensions and they'll cut a piece for you. So using what you taught us, you can fix just there are millions of windows that are built like this oh, yeah. um, and if it's single pane and it has got that glazing you can do what you just did absolutely but recently last 20 30 40 years our windows have changed significantly oh, right time. and yeah. it's typical now that we have two panes of glass insulating sometimes glass three. sometimes three yeah. that's a whole different fix oh absolutely right. so what you do is you get the sash out you get the dimensions, you go to the manufacturer and say, I need a new window. Okay. And they get it, and then you have to screw or attach the new one back into the old one. So it's not going to be as inexpensive as this fix. Absolutely um, not. <laughs> but there are still millions of these windows out there, so you're going to be able to use those techniques on a lot of windows. Oh, yeah. All right, nice job. Good information, as always. Thank you. When you think of NASA, you probably think of space. But did you know that NASA is also responsible for the technology behind this and this? Yep, even those. For more than 50 years, the technology that has supported astronauts' work in space has also had a major impact on everyday life on Earth. And that work continues here at Johnson Space Center, where new technology is being developed and tested that could one day be in every future house. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Ross. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Welcome to Mission Control. What an engineer's dream. It is pretty incredible, I have to say, to work here every day. I get to work for the space station. I get to determine when we launch vehicles to the space station, what we pack in them, and what the crew does with them on orbit. I mean, it's amazing the fact that you get to talk to astronauts in space 250 miles above us. It's amazing. Yep. Yep, and a lot of people think about Space Station as a research vessel, but in fact, there are actually six people living on board the space station. That's their home. That's where they live every day. And I have someone, Scott Tingle, on board the space station right now who wants to talk to you. No way. Are you ready to meet him? Yeah. Let's do it. All right. All right. Okay, I am ready to go. Hey, Scott, Ross Trithui here. It's so excited to meet you. Great to meet you too. Thanks for uh, for coming in and welcome aboard the International Space Station. I really wanted to know what's it like to be in space. Oh, well, the uh, you know, physically being here is uh, is really cool. It's um, you know you get to do stuff like this, and just kind of float around, and, you know, turn sideways <laughs> and, and float like things you you've dreamed of doing as a uh, as a child. And uh, riding the rocket is extremely cool, and uh, and being up here. Uh, with all these in incredible systems uh, is really cool. Well, all the luxuries we take for granted here on Earth, you know, oxygen, water, you know, sunshine, we have all that, you know, you don't really get that in space. Uh, that's true, and it's, uh, it's a little bit of an adaptation to, uh, to, to do that, and uh, so to, to get the water and continue having the water, it, it actually takes work. You don't just, you can't just always go to the faucet and turn on the water and expect there to be good water without having to do a little bit of work every week to make sure that the systems are working right and, uh, and it has the right balance to be able to, uh, to turn all of our wastewater into uh, drinking water. 
Well, Scott, I got to say thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your service. And uh, I hope to see you on the ground in a little bit here in Houston. Uh, thanks for coming to visit, visit us up here on the uh, space station. And uh, thanks for taking the time and thanks for being interested. And I'll, uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Safe travels. So that was insane. Totally insane to talk to Scott in space. I mean, it's bucket list. That's in indescribable. It's pretty awesome, right? Yeah. So how would you like to go to the space station? Wait, are you serious? I'm serious. OK, I can't launch you on a rocket, but I can show you the full scale mock ups we use to train the crews before we send them on board the space station. Yeah. I can show you all the systems that we use to keep them alive and make it a home. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. It's like a little space house tour. All right. So this is the training facility? This is it. This all is right. where we train the astronauts to live on the space station. So Behind cool. you, you can see all the life-size modules exactly like they are on orbit. So cool. Over here, this is like our classroom setting where we train the astronauts how to live aboard the space station okay. in our life-size racks that house each one of our different systems. Okay, and what is the system called? Well, like Scott was talking about, we need regenerative systems on the space station for our environment. So here we have our regenerative environment control life support systems. Got it. This is my friend Laura, and she is a life support engineer. Hi, Laura. Nice hey, to meet you. Nice to meet you. So water is one of the essential uh, elements for humans to live. Mm -hmm. On the International Space Station, about 90% of that water is recycled, and it all starts here in the urine processor assembly. So the urine comes from the toilet, and it's plumbed here. The heart of it is called vapor compression distillation system. Uh, and so what it does is it, because we're in, uh, we have no gravity on the space station, uh, it rotates this drum here at a very high speed to keep the water to the outside. Uh, and then we use low pressure and heat to uh, evaporate that water off of the, um, the surfaces. So the good water evaporates and the bad salts stay so behind. So you're basically boiling the clean, safe drinking water exactly out of the right. urine. Exactly right. And then we yeah. collect that water and we send it over to the water processor. Okay. Which is here. Wow. And this uses a system of filters to polish this water into drinkable water so that yesterday's coffee becomes today's coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I love about it is that there's places on this earth that don't have access to clean, safe drinking water, and they have plenty of wastewater. The fact that you can take this technology and take the waste and convert it into safe, clean drinking water, love it. You're exactly right. There are actually developing countries on earth that is using this technology. Awesome. All right, Ross, come on in. Welcome wow. to the space station. Oh, I feel like I'm in space. This is crazy. Pretty cool, and complex. right? complex. <laughs> Very complex. This is our laboratory module. Okay. If you look back behind you, that's our crew quarters or their bedroom. Okay. A couple more research modules. Down that way is the kitchen. We call it the galley and the exercise room. All right. But right now, I want to introduce you to my friend John. He's hey, going to John. talk about the Howdy. oxygen system. Okay. One very important thing with life support systems is ventilation. We have to circulate the atmosphere within the space station to make it comfortable for the crew. Mm -hmm. One way we do that, we have air intakes on the deck here, and we have air returns uh, on the overhead, and that circulates the air within the space station. So you have constant circulation going all that the time? That is correct, all the time. All right, I'm dying to know, how does it work? On Earth, we breathe in oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide and water vapor. Plants then take that carbon dioxide in convert it back to oxygen, and send it back into the air. On the International Space Station, the astronauts breathe the same way, but without plants, the carbon dioxide would overtake the space station and make it impossible to breathe. To counter that, we have created an oxygen generation assembly. It sends a jolt of electricity into the water, effectively splitting it into oxygen and hydrogen. That process is called electrolysis. The oxygen is then sent back through the air system, and the hydrogen is vented outside the space station alongside the carbon dioxide. So where does the water come from? So believe it or not, the water actually comes from the water reclamation system that you just saw. The crew can use that water for washing and drinking, but we can also use the water for making oxygen. And this system then circulates the air to control temperature and humidity as well. Wow. It's freezing cold in space. So there are lines of ammonia outside that collect cold and transfer it to water glycol lines inside. The air then pushes across the cold pipes and keeps the station cool. All the mechanicals on board generate a lot of heat, so the air system primarily cools the space station. Since the air has moisture in it, including the water vapor exhaled by the astronauts, it is forced to condense when it hits the cold pipes. That condensate is collected and then sent back to the water reclamation system. It sounds just like an air conditioner. You take warm air across a cold coil and get condensation to form. That is correct. And on Earth, that water just drains away. But on the space station, we want to collect that condensate and turn it back into drinking water. 
I'm just amazed at how the systems are all interconnected, and I assume these processes are highly energy intensive. You know, how do you power it all? Let's step outside, I'll show you. So Ross, over here on the wall, we were just inside one of those little white modules, but you see the blue fins on yep. either side? Those are photovoltaic solar arrays. So photovoltaic panels to power the entire space station. Yep. I mean, what a perfect place for it. You got no trees, no clouds, no shading, right? Keep in mind, we do have one major obstruction, the Earth. So the space station is revolving around the Earth every 90 minutes. So roughly half the time we're in darkness, half the time we're in light. When we're in the sun, we power directly from the solar rays. When we're in darkness, we power from batteries. I mean, the solar power matched up with battery storage, that's an up and coming trend in my industry. That's good, we've been doing it for 20 years. <laughs> The technology I saw today, it really seems possible to have more people living in space. Absolutely. We have pretty sophisticated systems on the space station to support life, but we still have to launch some critical supplies and supplement with oxygen, a little bit of water, and definitely food. Yeah. If we want to look at extended exploration missions, we really need to cultivate our technologies for the regenerative systems. I mean, you're talking about extended missions to Mars, right? Potentially, yes, but keep in mind, a mission to Mars could be a year and a half in duration. So if we're going to send people to live there, we have to have a fully regenerative system. Right, I mean, what's the most interesting about it is that you guys are working on technology to get to Mars that really have a practical use here on yeah. Earth. I mean, the fact that you guys can harness every bit of energy and resource, utilizing it to the absolute fullest. So thank you very much, Ryan, for the tour. Thank you. I can't wait to see what NASA does next. Stay tuned. You lucky dog. Oh, You've really always cool. been into space. <laughs> jealous dog. I am jealous. Well, down here on Earth, we've been talking about moving heat, not making heat for a long time. You know, geothermal and super efficient heat pumps. They're moving heat so efficiently, but they're also using that same principle for other resources, right? For water, for oxygen. There's no oxygen in space, so they know that there's oxygen in water. Yeah. So they can take that oxygen out, pump it back in the space station, and repeat the process. Waste so. nothing. So yeah. I'm thinking about the systems that you saw up there and how they might translate to down here. We obviously don't have an oxygen problem. Um, I don't know what you think about the urine and whether that conversion is going too far or not, but right. what can we use down here? Right, processing urine into safe drinking water is probably a long way off. But condensate, especially in hot areas of this country, which have huge air conditioning loads, loads and really, really long right. droughts, yeah. You know, the fact that they could take that water and reclaim it for gray water use, right? For toilets and for watering sure. plants. But they could also take it a step further and filter it and use it for potable right. drinking water. Right now, all that water is wasted. Cool. All right. All right. Well, good story. I appreciate it. All right. Well, if you've got questions about Earth, we'd love to hear from you. So until next time, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Richard Thuey. I'm Ross Thuey. For Ask This Old House. So they only use a telephone. With all the things they've invented. Thanks for watching. This old house has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.